So Gary, okay, I've been thinking what the first question should be, and I, I figured it out. I'd like to ask you, what is your favorite sandwich? <laughs> My favorite sandwich? Well, I'm from the Midwest, so it has yeah. to have mayonnaise and white bread. So, uh, um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the first movies I think I remember seeing your name on was uh, Remo Williams, where uh, I believe you did Foley, Foley. on that. Foley, yeah. yeah. Love doing. I did Foley for. I did Foley for Willow. Yeah, I thought of that too. Yeah, that must have been fun. I'd like to hear some of the your experiences on those because Remo Williams is a fun film. It's one of those little undiscovered gems of the '80s that I I really enjoyed. I think the the expectation was that Remo Williams would turn into a franchise a series. Yeah, a series, and it, I guess it didn't do well enough. But it was a it was a good you know action um, uh, film. So of course, great for Foley. Um, and I love, I mean, talk about if you do, if you want to do sound design and sound effects for a living, you know, it's great to know how to record in, in the world and operate all that stuff. But it's really great to do Foley because you have to be clever about taking things and turning, you know, cornstarch in the snow and all the, all the kind of classic or discover on your own Foley tricks to make something work. Sure. Uh, so you, you were lucky enough to be uh, toward the end of the era when, when we were still working on glorious film and mag. Um, yeah. Now that you're in the wonderful digital world, how can you, looking back, how do you compare those those kind of work ethics and that that whole experience? Well, you think about it. I mean, the great you know, the great sound effects editors. And when I started, there were you know people like Ken Fisher and Terry Acton. And I love Terry. Terry I Acton's adore great, Terry. Renowned, renowned sound effects editors. And think mm -hmm. about what they had to do, to do then. Because now a sound effects editor has their Pro Tool session with you know three kajillion tracks, and you cut everything in context. You hear how it works together. If you want to build something out of six elements, you build out of six elements and they come together. Yeah. You know, in those days, it was a moviola and yeah. one one tape head, and it maybe, best, maybe a cam with a couple tracks, but <laughs> yeah, a cam would be a, or a sync head. You know, where you would roll it, you know, by hand and listen to three, three or four sounds kind of at the same. You have no idea how things would work together. So it's the equivalent of why DPs were so um, famous and 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 uh, respected, especially yeah. then. It was they could see what it was going to look like on film before anyone yeah. else. Yeah. Again, in the digital world, you can look at the monitor and you see what it's going to look like now, right? On the exactly. set. Exactly. So it's kind of gone. In the old mag days, the sound editors, especially, they were really good at assembling scenes in their head. Yes. And then you get to, you know, Terry Acton, Ken Fisher, Richard Hims, people like that. You get to the to the mixing stage, you go, man, this works great. Yeah. That's a talent. That's a real thing. So learning that way, no one's ever going to learn that way again, but learning that way is good. The, the history of recording, field recording has gotten to, it's so easy now, the zooms and you know the small recorders that sound great. And I, I admit this because I, I like being able to do something on the fly. So I just use my phone. There's different apps, Dolby has an app. There are different apps that if you sure. want to record something quickly on your phone, just you know, yeah. you can see the parameters and record it. And, and, and you can get little mic plugins that you can plug that make it a little better too. Yeah, yeah, there's right. some wonderful stuff out there. So the way that we, everyone takes way too many photos these days, right? <laughs> yeah, get sad, so that's think, great. And what happens is that <laughs> people don't think about recording sounds as a way to have memories too. And sure. About places you visited or people that you love, or, you know, so recording, we just don't think about it as much. So I think that maybe that'll catch up and people will start using their phones to do more audio recording. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. That's, that's a really good point that I should stress. With my work too that's a very good idea and terminator 2 the other thing was terminator 2 was a big job for ilm so kind of as a company and we tried to do, do this especially in those days a lot of movies would be an ilm doing the visual effects and skywalker doing the sound it, it made sense um uh so i don't know you know i, yeah, I was again lucky to be in a, in a company that had a good reputation and so somehow i lucked out and and Got that one. That was such a learning experience for me, um, because it was a huge action film. And the, the thing I learned in that in that movie more than anything else was that less is more, which is a lesson everyone learns in everything. But in action movie sound jobs, you kind of you, know, you just think this is going to be when I add the five hundredth effect, this is going to be like the greatest scene ever. <laughs> 
James Cameron was really, really good at, in the mix, weeding everything out, just taking it out. And, and it's, it's remarkable, it's remarkable to me then that you have a, you know, like the, the semi truck chase in a canal or something in that movie, which if you look at it and look to this day, you think this is a big scene. This is a big sounding scene. And it's big because it's got as little sounded in as you can get away with. Right. That's what makes it big. So each sound gets its moment. And you can have a lot of sounds, but generally in scenes like that, having lots of sounds sequentially is more effective than having them in parallel. So, you know, you just, this is the focus, this is the focus, this is the focus, and you keep changing the focus and guiding the attention of the audience. And then the sound, maybe just a handful of sounds or even one sound, it, it reads really well and it reads powerful. And that, uh, that was not a lesson I would have learned on my own. That was, that was uh, Jim Cameron's sort of <laughs> like tossing sound effects out left and right in the, in the mix. And he was right, that guy. Yeah. And it, you know, we, we mentioned Randy Tom earlier. I will tell you that the, the backdraft sound, you know, the scenes when they, they test a, a doorknob to see, you know, if it's hot, you know, the, the literal backdraft. And there was a wisp of smoke that would come underneath the crack in the door. And, and instead of smoke or fire sounds, I would use a coyote howl, try to make Ooh. it a little more like a coyote how process that sounds weird but then when it explodes out towards us uh one of the main elements was a belch from randy tom <laughs> i thought belch. you were gonna i thought you were gonna say howie hammerman <laughs> the, the, the howie hammerman belch of people who know, you know ben burks up there's uh in in uh in return of the jedi when the sarlacc uh eats uh eats people in the desert in yep. Jada, and that's howie hammerman belching yeah. and et also i believe and E.T.'s little bell fan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That sound. See, the Hollywood Sound Museum will have a whole wing. <laughs> yep. <Bell-tister>. There are <laughs> a few good ones. Uh, what's his name? Who played uh, Billy in Gremlins was an amazing belcher. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember on Gremlins too, he did a whole series that we just had in the library, and ultimately we ended up using them for the 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 vegetable gremlin. So we, we kind of hit a wall trying to figure out a vocal for the the food gremlin, the vegetable gremlin, and they that's just, actually that's for the for your museum. One of the major categories that people would find really interesting for film history, film sound history, are creature vocals. Everything from you know King Kong to uh, you know through Ben's work on Star Wars films and Gremlins and it's, uh, uh, there are some. You worked on some dinosaur film, I seem to remember that. Uh... Well, I, I, when I did Jurassic Park, I realized that was in a tradition at that time already of, uh, of you know, following the footsteps of a lot of creature work over the years. So you both have to stay true to, you know, I didn't know what dinosaurs really sounded like, but you people have the Hollywood idea. I mean, there's a T-Rex in King Kong, you know. Sure. That... I was going to say Murray Spivak, who is, you know, one of the, the gods of... Uh modern sound design I, and you must have studied his work and uh, yeah, yeah and the technique that Murray, Murray Skivak used for doing King Kong which is recording real animals playing them backwards adding the backwards to the forwards changing the pitch it's exactly what I did on Jurassic Park there was yeah. no no difference I was just I was using a Sinclair and he was using you know uh, old optical uh, you know, recorders and things yeah. but I remember getting criticized after the after the movie came out and there was a scientist somewhere who said that the T-Rex would not have roared, it would have had no way to roar. And it, the scientists claimed that the, the most prominent sound for the T-Rex would have been stomach gurgles, which would have made for a very different movie. If you think <laughs> yeah, go for, those, uh, go for those burps in the library that you had. <laughs> yeah, back, back to the belches, it always goes yeah. back to the belches. It always goes back to that, yeah.